countries of Africa Our planet's second largest continent right after Asia We are the countries of Africa There are 54 countries presently that we will teach ya My name's Algeria, my capital is Algiers I'm Angola, Luanda's been my capital for years Benin is my name, my capital's Porto Novo Botswana is my name, Cameroon is my capital I'm Burkina Faso, oh I get a goose my capital My name's Burundi, Bujumbura's my capital Cape Verde is my name, my capital is Praia Come to Cameroon, Yande is my capital to teach ya I'm the Central African Republic, my capital Bungie is what you saw I am Chad, my capital's New Germina I'm Comoros, Moroni's my capital, yeah I'm the Democratic Republic of Congo, capital's Kinshasa I'm the Republic of the Congo, Brazzaville's my capital Cote d'Ivoire is my name, capital's Yamosuko I'm Djibouti and my capital's Djibouti City My name is Gambia, my capital is Montreal I'm Ghana, my capital, Lacroix like is really cool Guinea's my name, Conakry is my capital I'm Guinea Bissau, Bissau's my capital My name is Kenya, my capital's Nairobi I'm Lesotho, my capital, Maseru's the place to be Hi, I'm the My capital's Port Louis, how's that? I am Morocco, my capital's name is Rabat Mozambique is my name, my capital is Maputo I am Namibia, Windhoek's my capital Niger is my name, my capital is Nyame I am Nigeria, my capital's Abuja, here to stay I'm Rwanda, it's me, my capital
for watching Kids Learning Tube. Please subscribe below and join us next week to learn more about everything. Hey, do you know this song? <laughs> Of course you do, everyone does, but did you know that that song was actually originally written and recorded by a South African artist? Yup, that wasn't the original version, nor is this one or this one. This is the original, and although it's now arguably one of the most famous tunes in the world, and for over eight decades made a lot of people a lot of money, its composer Solomon Linda actually died penniless and his family so poor that they couldn't afford a tombstone for his grave. So let's talk about it. Solomon Linda and his group The Evening Birds released Mbube in 1939. It was actually mostly improvised by Solomon during a recording session and the song Bube or Zulu for the Lion was inspired by the group's childhood experiences when they chased away lions that stalked the family cattle. The song became an instant hit in South Africa and not long after, Solomon agreed to sell the rights of his song to a South African recording company for 10 shillings, less than two dollars. I know, that's practically nothing, but remember, this was 1939 in British World South Africa and he was a black man. No one got royalties and copyright was unknown. So when Solomon got the two dollars and a job at his boss's packing plant, he thought he'd come out of the deal okay, but that was just the beginning of a big injustice. Gayo, the guy who Solomon had sold to, sent a copy of the song to Decca Records and from there Peter Seeger got a hold of it. Mishearing the original lyrics, he changed the title to Wimowe, recorded it with the Weavers in 1952, and brought it to the top of the charts. The song would go on to be reinterpreted by dozens of American artists without Solomon receiving a dime or credit. In a 2000 Rolling Stone article, South African journalist Ryan Malan wrote about Solomon's story and estimated that his song had earned 15 million dollars for its use in The Lion King alone. And yet, Solomon's family lived in a house with no ceilings. The publicity that the article generated prompted a lawsuit between Solomon's estate and Disney, and in 2004, with the full backing of the South African government, Solomon's descendants sued the Walt Disney Company for its use of his song in The Lion King. In February 2006, Disney settled for an undisclosed sum, but Solomon's estate didn't receive substantial royalties from the song until recently. All in all, this was not a story of theft as much as it was a terrible injustice. Solomon Linda was cheated, but it does bring a smile to my heart knowing that he created one of the most recognizable songs in history. We are a disconnected people. We are powerless in disconnection. This is where all the power is. You see? This is where all the power is. Whether you are at the center of your own network or a part of someone else's network, this is where the power is. There's a beautiful, beautiful African proverb that says, when spiders unite, they can tie up a lion. When we connect, because we are disconnected, we're disconnected from those of like mind, we're disconnected from the best practices in our community, I don't care what it is that you want to do, what profession you want to engage in, what business you want to get into, I can introduce you to brothers and sisters all over America that is doing, they are doing it to death. You just don't know who they are. You are disconnected from them. There is no power in disconnection. Okay, when we connect, we prevent interlopers from coming into our communities and taking and destroying at will. Hi, George. Try to open up the Booker T. Washington delicatessen in Chinatown and see what happens. So we must connect. We must connect the dots. That 
must be the movement for our people in the 21st century. We need a lot of us doing a little instead of a few of us doing a lot. We need to get together to get ahead. University of the West Indies receives 500,000 US dollars reparation payment. The following statement is issued by Professor Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies and Chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission in response to the university's receipt, receipt of a 500,000 US dollars reparation payment from UK philanthropist Bridget Freeman. On the heels of the University of Glasgow's agreement to enter into a 20 million pound reparation program with the university, of the West Indies apologizing for its financial participation in the Caribbean slave economy. An Englishwoman has agreed to pay reparations for, for her family's involvement in slavery. Bridget Freeman, a British citizen, has agreed to contribute 500,000 US dollars to the university's development fund through its 2021 global giving campaign. The philanthropist dis described being horrified and touched by the discussion on the impact of slavery on the region today. She agreed that reparation should be paid by those who benefited from the crime against humanity. It's not right, she said, we owe it. The giving back just seems obvious. Bridget's family married into the Barbados slave owning class and became involved in its development. As an accomplished musician, she has also declared an intention to contribute to the newly established Faculty of Culture creative and performing arts at the Cavill campus in Barbados. It is a seminal moment in the regional reparation movement. Bridget Freeman should be celebrated as a citizen who has broken ranks with the British white supremacy, conservatism, and has become an activist reparationist. Bridget has accepted her responsibility and willingness to be held accountable. In this regard, she is a reparations hero, and we hope that the millions of other British citizens in her position will step up, come forward, and participate in the healing and development that is reparation. The reparation investment will be directed to needy students in order to sustain the access revolution that is central to the Caribbean development and the university's strategic plan.
Hello everyone, Ruhi Chenet here. We are in Burundi, which has been chosen as per the analysis reports of the World Bank, IMF, and many other official institutions as the poorest country in the world almost every year in the last 62 years. The country has a population of approximately 12.5 million and its people live in such great poverty that it is also known as the unhappiest country in the world and the annual income of the average working citizen is approximately 180 US dollars. Although the unemployment rate in the country is not known, one out of every three people is thought to be unemployed. Imagine that if you are lucky to be able to work day and night, your monthly salary is only $15 and you have to support a family of eight. Welcome to the world's poorest and unhappiest country. When we landed at Bujumbura International Airport, the only airport in the country with asphalt runway, we were really surprised when we looked at the information display. They were using the demo version of the operating system to avoid paying a fee. At the scene of an accident that we saw on our way to the hotel, a group of children were standing around the dog that had been hit by a car. The Republic of Burundi, the heart of Africa, is located in the Great Rift Valley, where East Africa meets the African Great Lakes. The surface area of the country is only 27,834 kilometers square. Although almost everyone is engaged in agriculture, for this reason, this geography, which has many mountainous areas, is unfortunately not enough to feed 12.5 million people. The most populous city, Bujumbura, has a population of 380,000 people. We are in the Buterere district in the center. The first striking detail is that there are children everywhere. The kids of the neighborhood are busy fishing. 65% of the country's population is under the age of 25 and 45% is under the age of 15. Only 3% are 65 years old or older. They don't have many toys to play with. There are children spinning a tire with a stick, playing board games with beer caps, making toy cars out of plastic bottles, and playing football with a hollow tire. According to the United Nations data published 10 years ago, the average life expectancy of the people was about 49 years. Since only 7.6% of the population have access to electricity, there are phone charging points in many neighborhoods. Although the year 2021 is behind, most people in this country still do not use smartphones. Even the informational footages on the airplanes show images of old technologies. We are in a rice field in Buterere. Here are the farmers that try to feed Bujumbura city. This is the place huh? Bujumbura gets the rice from. About 86% of the country consists of rural areas like this one. Almost 90% of the entire population's job is farming. We are on the move to see the home of an average farmer in the poorest country in the world where almost everyone is a farmer. Let's go. We are fine. There are homeless people who have no choice but to get wet when it rains. We see a child taking a shower, taking advantage of the rainwater. We can get in the house. This is their house? Yeah, this uh, is just one house. room. There are eight people living in this house. It means there uh, are eight children, two parents. This is their bed, this one. So they just, you know, just uh, spread yeah, it and sleep on it. And they sleep on it. So they have another one, this is for children. Mm -hmm. So eight children sleep on this. Oh. They took it from the garbage yeah. there. These old eight children belong to her? Eight children belong to her. Yeah. What is his name? How old is John? He's 58. He's a farmer. How much does he earn per oh. month? Oh, yeah. How old is the eldest son? What does he do now? He has gone to garbages to collect his different things. Thank you for your time. What does he want to say to the camera? John, who plants beans, is trying to take care of his family on a revenue of $10 a month. And all 10 members of the family sleep on the floor in the same room. They do not even have electricity in their homes. But John's situation is still better than the most other people we will be seeing shortly.
Welcome back to the YouTube channel. It's your favorite village boy, Mr. Ghana, baby. And I've always been telling you guys that agriculture is the future. And I'm not going to stop talking about this until I see the youth of Africa investing in agriculture. I am a farmer. I'm not a fisherman. But I keep on telling you guys that the things that we overlook, those are the things that can earn us more money. I mean, most of you are telling me that we don't have enough money to invest into real estate. We don't have enough money to invest in industries in Africa. But I want to tell you that you have enough money to invest in a farm. And this is why I brought this episode, which is titled, Teaching You How to What? Farm in Africa with little amount of money. I'm not saying it's all about going to the farm to weed. Yeah, it's all about investing little amount of money to do petty things surrounding you that will earn you more money and that is why i'm bringing you a new episode this episode is not about only interviewing young africans i can interview anyone i mean anyone who has something to teach you so that the thousand ghana city that you have the thousand dollars that you have in your pocket you can use it to invest in something meaningful surrounding you my name is still mr ghana baby come with me it's 10 minutes episode and i'm gonna see you as soon as i'm done don't forget to like the video subscribe and be part of this awesome family two million this year i'll see you all you know what i saw you on the internet and i had to come and look for you but on the internet, when I read your profile, they told me you're a Kenyan. Yes, yes, I'm a Kenyan. You're a Kenyan? Yes, I'm born third generation Kenyan. Third generation? Of Indian origin. Um, you speak Swahili? Yes, I speak Swahili. Habari? Zuri sana. Um, on a phone and nini? I don't know what even I'm saying, man. Jeez, man, my, my Swahili is so bad. Niko na wode maya, the legend himself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure meeting you. Same and um, I have, the reason why I came to see you today is like, I realize that you're doing something new, something different. I'm trying to um, inspire so many young Africans to invest in Africa with a little amount of money. And that's what led me to your house. So this is where you live. Yes, this is where I live. This is my backyard. And you can see I have fresh fish coming right from my backyard. You're doing everything at your backyard. This is my backyard. And this is the concept we want to develop because, because of urbanization. A lot of people are moving to cities and they don't have huge tracts of land to put up ponds. So we are trying to encourage urban aquaculture in your backyards. You know what? I, I know when it comes to fish farming, the ones that I've visited, I mean, it's huge. It, it can take the whole area. Yes. But you're just doing it right at your backyard. Yes, yes, yes. And this, this is bioflock technology. Now, what you see them doing in huge ponds, I'll explain to you, in a huge pond, okay, if it is unmanaged, mm -hmm. from an acre of uh, land and a pond on an acre of land, when you have not managed your pond, mm. you can get around six to eight tons of fish from that one acre. With my technology, if you put it on one acre, you will get more than 70 tons of fish. I am here because so many Africans that watch me, especially the young ones, are saying that it's so expensive to invest in Africa. H how much do you think it will cost us to, I mean, invest in this type of technology? Okay, for this type of technology, for example, this is a three meter diameter tank because I don't have a lot of space, but the basic commercial size is a four meter diameter tank, which can take 10,000 liters of water. Whoa. Yeah, so that 10,000 liters of water can give you around uh, 300 to 500 kilos of fish. Now, depending on how you are harvesting, if you are harvesting at, uh, say, 300 grams, mm. you are talking of 1,600 tilapia from a 4-meter diameter tank Is from your backyard. Can we just go and check it out? I don't know if you're willing to train people for me because that's the reason why I'm here. Um, how do we reach out to, in terms of if somebody wants consultation or want to know how to okay. um, do this in their backyard? Yeah, we, we have a website, okay. uh, www.bioflockafrica.com. Okay. So you can reach us through the website, our contacts and everything is there.
global warming is a real problem, but poverty is the main problem facing the African race. Uh, poverty is the main cause of the problems, our main problems, major problems in Africa and in the diaspora. For example, blue collar crime. In terms of the solution or the reduction of the problem, it is uh, greater self-reliance, not self-sufficiency because we can't be self-sufficient. This is a global community, but to increase our self-reliance and to reduce our dependency on the other races for our bread and butter and own ownership of our own businesses is the major uh, step economic equality with the other races, economic liberation, economic independence uh, is the main strategy, the main means of reducing our dependence on the other races for our bread and butter. Um, and one particular thing I want to mention is, uh, is in terms of import substitution, especially when it comes to our food supply, uh, at least to the level where we can provide for our basic needs, not our total food supply, but a minimum level for our basic needs. And we have a lot of uh, uh, products that we can use. Last time I mentioned the cassava and the products from cassava and uh, sweet potato. Sweet potato is a super food, but particularly the cassava, which is very easy to grow. Uh, and um, there are products I will mention. I mentioned uh, Bami in Jamaica, not only eating the cassava, sweet cassava, but also products like the uh, uh, sweet, the Bami in Jamaica and the Kasserip uh, from Guyana, a very unique product. Uh, business opportunities exist both in the on the production side and in the on the marketing side, uh, because finding markets and providing market for producers, for farmers and other producers, is a key. Uh, business opportunity and I, I've seen in the case of Jamaica when there was a, a marketing agency, the agricultural marketing agency, farmers produced, they, they were able to flood the market more than what the country was able to, 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 to buy and it's an opportunity for uh, individual, for black folks to help to find market for individual farmers and for uh, co-ops and for uh, cooperations that black people are involved with. And um, the, this idea, this point was strengthened again by my, my brethren in Trinidad, Brother Ozzy, who he thinks that the marketing problem is a bigger problem uh, a bigger hindrance to us black folks getting involved in business than even our fear of of taking risks and getting into business and and so on. He thinks that the marketing problem, once there is a, a market, black people will step forward and produce for the market. So um, the other thing is, um, as I said before, the, there are opportunities, substitutes, and we need to uh, be involved in the substitution, both on, on the production side and on the the uh, marketing side. And um, uh, you will see there are some segments, uh, particularly about cassava, and some slides showing the uh, the the potential substitute cassarip. Uh, a, a unique 
preservative, natural preservative from, from Guyana, uh, which the American Indians have been, been using in, in and, uh, wheat products, sorry, cassava products claim that it has caused a, a very low incidence of cancer among the American Indians. Suddenly, you left me alone by myself. Welcome to Niji Farms and Allied Services. Uh, this is a farm established like almost uh, four years ago. Our aim is to make sure that we we'll do a proper farm uh, uh, operations and teach people how to achieve a proper uh, profit on the farm. So this is a cassava farm, one of our farms. So we we are operating on over 3,000 acres of land planted already. We are moving towards almost uh, 5,000 acres this year. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to do a proper land clearing, land preparation. We are going to see all those operations the way it's been done. So we are going to see the people who are planting the way we are moving a project forward. Everybody is going to see it now by the time we go around. We're trying to divide our operations into different uh, stages. We have a, a, a section on land clearing, we have a section on land uh, preparation, then we have, have another section on planting, another section on proper weed control management. So, what we're trying to say is that we develop different service providers for different operations on the farm so that we are going to showcase whatever we are doing, put it on the TV for people to see the way it's been done. So people can actually learn by watching all this and not necessarily come to the farm to watch and look at the missing gap and what if they turn to be a farmer, the advantage and the benefit. We are going to be projecting it later on TV. So everything is going to be integrated in a way that we can actually get a proper resource and lead Nigeria to the next level of agriculture. That's what we are trying to do. Provide a different solution and get agricultural, agricultural uh, production rights in Nigeria. My name is Kola Adeniji. I'm the MD CEO of Niji Farms. The Niji Farms, we have another sister company, that's Niji Foods, add value to whatever we are doing. The Niji Luka is the one that deals with engineering aspect of it, designing and fabrication and maintaining all the our uh, processing equipment. And we equally sell out for people too. We develop we people to set out if they are intent to set up a present center, we support people in, in fabrication and setting it up for them. <laughs>